Video games are one of the fastest growing sectors in the entertainment industry. That shows no signs of slowing down, even amid a global pandemic. Research firm Nuzu says the number of gamers around the world is expected to top 3 billion by next year. But critics have long warned of a dark side to gaming, with issues ranging from a decline in mental health to misogynistic behavior. Extremist networks, too, have found that gaming platforms can be fertile ground to find new recruits. The action in video games like these is intense. I have your visual. Immersive. Get on the go. Don't get killed. For millions of gamers, it's an obsession. They play for hours on end, often interacting online with other players. We got this. Video games are the main attraction here at the Replay Cafe in the U.S. city of Detroit. I enjoy the game. I didn't play it to like interact with people from the start, but if it happens, it happens. Either in-game or on platforms used by gamers such as Discord and Twitch, such interactions often lead to positive connections. But they can also be used to spread hate. I've seen like servers that were created after being inspired by Auschwitz and like concentration camps. And you'll role play as a concentration camp you know, guard and then the other person is somebody who's in the prison. It can become yet more problematic when hateful rhetoric in the game crosses over into the real world. We're about an hour outside of Detroit on the way to see someone who says he's a former neo-Nazi who used to use video games to recruit others. He's 25 years old and has asked us to conceal his identity out of concerns for his safety. John, which isn't his real name, says he was brought into a neo-Nazi movement himself as a teenager. Bullied at school, he wanted a place to fit in. Soon, he was recruiting others like him. My tactic was to befriend the, the person that seemed down and make him feel special and, you know, saying, hey, you know, this is what I did, this is who I'm with. And I wouldn't pressure it, but it's if, hey, you feel the same way, do you, do you get bullied by non-whites, this, this, and that? And they, they, if they keep agreeing, eventually they're going to say, yeah, I want to be on board, and that's when they, they join. One method was displaying obvious or coded Nazi symbols in-game, some of which have now been banned, but are still accessible from stored versions. That allowed him to connect with those who might be open to the racist and fascist ideology he embraced. Sharing extremist content was another technique. The scary thing is for parents out there is I used to play Hitler's speeches and it would go through the kids' TV. By the end, he was taking part in neo-Nazi rallies. John says he left the movement in 2019 after positive interactions with other races and amid growing concern about fellow members wanting to engage in illegal activity. Now we're off to meet another former extremist. For two decades, Jeff Scoop was the leader of the National Socialist Movement, or NSM, a prominent neo-Nazi group. Now he runs an organization that helps people de-radicalize. He says video games were an important recruiting tool. His former group even developed its own games. Do you feel like people that are playing video games are more susceptible to the messages that you are trying to push in some way? Whenever you have an environment where there's not social interactions, you have people that are seeking things out. They're seeking out companionship. They're seeking out other, other types of things. and. The loneliness a lot of times uh, can and add to that. So when someone's isolated, they're more susceptible. Over the last two decades, Sarah according to data from the Center for Strategic and International Studies, far-right terrorism in the U.S. is on the rise. The center says since 2015, right-wing extremists have been involved in 267 plots or attacks and have killed 91 people. Protesters managed to break their way in, smashing doors, smashing... The storming of the U.S. Capitol in January of last year opened many people's eyes to the potential for violence. But are video games really making things worse? Or are they just one more way for bad actors to reach potential recruits? Javed Ali, who teaches at the University of Michigan, spent over a decade working with the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security. I think, if anything, it shows how people are just leveraging 
technology as it emerges and most people use modern technology for completely benign purposes, but unfortunately we've seen both on the international terrorism side and now on the domestic terrorism side, extremists use them for all these extremist related purposes. And I just think that's how the technology curve usually works. As these new systems emerge, people try to take advantage of them and manipulate them. The constitutional right to free speech in the U.S. makes it legally difficult for law enforcement to monitor people who haven't committed a crime. In a statement, gaming and chat platform Discord told us that when they come across such activity, they take immediate action, including banning users and shutting down servers and engaging with law enforcement when appropriate. Another platform, Twitch, says its policy enables them to take action against users who committed egregious offenses, including violent extremism and hate group membership, entirely off the Twitch service. Back at the Replay Cafe, the world of far-right extremism seems distant. People are socializing. Young couples are on dates. The cafe's co-owner says the community they've built around gaming at places like this is a positive thing. If you're going to be gaming, you know, and you are radicalized, it's probably because you did it in isolation. You were allowed to develop opinions and feelings that have no correlation to external reality. So what I'd say is get your friends out of the house. Companies and law enforcement have made strides in recent years to combat extremists using gaming as a recruiting tool. But the reality is, with billions of gamers around the world, it's impossible to have eyes on every screen. Eleven years experience, 13 hours non-stop, and a 2,000 US dollar gaming setup. All this to win and become a professional gamer. This may sound innocent enough, but in reality, 18-year-old Song Chai, who doesn't want to be identified, is addicted to computer games. He's been seeing a psychiatrist to manage his gaming addiction on top of his ADHD. But he can't completely stop himself from gaming. Today, Somchai spends about 10 hours a day playing games. He does that in two separate sessions, taking a break in between for other activities like homework and exercise. By international standards, playing computer games for more than eight hours a day signifies severe gaming addiction. But for Somchai, it's a massive improvement from the days when his constant gaming sparked tension within his family. เห็นเก้าอี้ที่หักกันนั้นมั้ยคะคือเหมือนห้ามอะไรสักอย่างแล้วก็เหวี่ยงเลยค่ะเราก็มโหเขาแล้วเขาก็เหมือนเราจะต
like irritability, having a lot more frequent temper outbursts. They have poor or little impulse control. Uh, they, they control themselves uh, less than before. Uh, they have short, a lot short attention span. Uh, also, they have, um, in some cases, we see anxiety, increase in anxiety and depression. Uh, and some kids, they uh, can get become, uh, can become suicidal. I had uh, one patient who was brought to the emergency room because uh, the violent outburst. Doctors say the number of gaming addicts in Thailand has increased over the years. Thailand doesn't compile comprehensive national figures. But in Bangkok Siri Rat Hospital alone, one of the key institutions treating such addictions, the number of patients seeking treatment for gaming addiction has increased twofold from 110 cases five years ago to more than 200 cases last year. In terms of the statistics, uh, we have found at least 60% uh, to 100% increase uh, over the past five years. Number one is COVID pandemic. Kids stay home uh, because they cannot go to school uh, due to the lockdown. Most of the time they get bored and they switch uh, the screen uh, uh, from online learning to YouTube or most of the time to video game playing. And the second thing in Thailand, I think this is the endorsement of uh, Sports Authority of Thailand. They endorse the e-sport to be a legitimate professional sport. That's why uh, kids use this to tell their parents, uh, e-sport right now is a professional, e professional sport, so why don't you let me be play? Medical experts believe the number of gaming addicts is set to grow in Thailand and they're increasingly younger. That's due to factors like easier access to mobile devices, faster internet speed and a lack of awareness among parents and guardians about gaming addiction. <laughs> มักจะจริงๆแล้วไอคิวดีอ่ะนะคะเอ่อเสียศักยภาพเข้าไปทางที่เขาจะเรียนหนังสือจบมาทําเอ่อประโยชน์ให้กับประเทศชาติบางที
As video games expand their reach, the face of what a gamer looks like has evolved and more women are getting in on the action. But they still face abuse and gender-based discrimination. Australia is leading the way at fighting sexism within all levels of the industry, empowering females to break into the historically male-dominated space. Where is... Oh, no! <laughs> Dinah Senna has been immersed in the online gaming world, fighting baddies and warlords since she was just three years old. Oh wait, no, I found him, I found him, I'm going to follow him. Nearly 30 years later, she's fighting for representation and diversity. I am born and raised in Malaysia, but my ethnicity is Sri Lankan, so I'm basically Southeast Asian, South Asian. Never seen anyone else who looked like me in the games industry. I didn't grow up playing games with characters that looked like me either. Hey guys, I just got a present from Xbox. Making the online gaming world a place where everyone can belong is now her passion. Miss Senna, known online as Miss Do Geek, is now a well-regarded Australian content creator and gaming influencer. She is one of the first Xbox MVPs for the Australia and New Zealand region. She's also the founder of the not-for-profit community group Women of Xbox, a global initiative to support and empower female Xbox gamers. But despite her success, she says being a woman in the industry can be confronting. It was just horrifying to be told how terrible I am because I'm a girl. And, you know, I mean, I'm just paraphrasing here, but it's definitely been a real challenge uh, being screamed at through my headset by young boys just telling me that I should just go kill myself or uh, just disappear and never touch games again because I'm so terrible and I've cost them a win. And I'd get asked about my relationship status, I'd get hounded about whether I would date them. No, not in the mood, in the slightest. This 59-year-old woman, known as Haughty Chicken Online, has seen firsthand the evolution of gaming over her four decades in the space. She says acceptance of women there has improved over time, but more must be done to change the deeply ingrained misogyny within the online gaming world. There's also toxic behaviour where people come in and say, you're too old for that, what are you doing here? This is a young person space, and I have had that too. Um, and I've had threats of violence as well. I think we need to keep challenging the stereotype of what a gamer looks like and who a gamer is. It's not an 18-year-old teenage boy in mum and dad's basement. It's professionals, it's, it's academic. It's people of all ages, all genders, all identities. The statistics prove that. According to the 2022 Digital Australia report, just under half of the people who play video games are women. <laughs> Research from Lenovo and Reach3 Insights found that women face a disproportionate amount of harassment while gaming online. The survey, which analysed experiences of more than 900 women across China, Germany and the United States, found that the majority of abuse women face stems from gendered stereotypes. Patronising words and unsolicited relationship questions were some of the most reported types of comments women gamers received. And 59% of female gamers used non-gendered names to avoid harassment. Pre-pandemic, gaming festivals like this were held in Australia annually. They included a diversity lounge and showcased panel discussions on women in the gaming industry. In the absence of this major event, gaming companies have had to rely heavily on smaller workshops and virtual training. We have um, like an online workshop with an experienced facilitator that will take people through, you know, what is unconscious bias, what is best practice, um, you know, pairing people up in the industry to, to help you remove your biases, think about inclusive practices. According to Skill Search, the global average pay gap within the games and interactive industry is around 26%. It's something this wargaming company in Sydney is trying to tackle. Here, they believe empowering women on the games development side is what will ultimately help shift gender-based discrimination. To make sure that uh, we attract and retain uh, female professionals is uh, we provide flexible arrangements uh, and it's 
we are totally flexible here. Uh, we have uh, paid parental leave uh, to support uh, family commitments and work commitments. Uh, we have our diversity and inclusion group. If we look at our directors at Wargaming Sydney, so half of them are uh, women. We do. Uh, support bringing more uh, female professionals into managerial roles. Silcian Harding is one of them. She's worked at the company for seven years. She's now a software engineering manager and about to have her fourth child. I think there's also a perception that the industry is made up of a lot of like young, childless, single people, or, you know, not unmarried people. So, uh, yeah, I feel like a little bit of not pressure, but like this opportunity to kind of show there are people who have families and children, there are women with children. <laughs> and you can raise a family, you can have a career, you can work in this industry and there, there are lots of supports in place. Each of these people has experienced serious adult cyber abuse. Australia is the only country in the world that has appointed a federal e-safety commissioner, a government agency committed to keeping its citizens safer online. Last month, sweeping new online laws came into effect across the country that give the e-safety commissioner new powers to crack down on platforms and force them to remove abusive or violent content. Up until now, you could abuse people with relative impunity, and that's what the Australian government is trying to change here with these laws, um, through fines, but through a broad range of civil penalties. So, um, um, and this will force the platforms to um, st start more consistently enforcing their own policies. The misogyny, the prejudice, and the racism that we see manifesting through online gaming um, is designed to silence. The bill is seen as controversial, with organisations representing companies like Google and Facebook warning its scope is too broad and draconian. But for online gamers, it allows them to fight back, and the Safety Act has international reach, meaning no matter where in the globe your abuser may be, they can be stopped. It's just one more step that can help transform online warriors into real-life role models.